tonight on the Online Wine Tasting Club, Molly takes her first ever trip to a vineyard. Alex finds out that apparently he has aged. I don't know quite how that's happened. So, um, yeah, yeah, I think that's what it comes down to. And we get to meet a cat. But we're still waiting to see, and I've been speaking to other vineyards whether, uh, even though oh, <laughs> cat has just moved the camera. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's time to put England against the rest of the world with the Discoverer series. Good evening, a very, very warm welcome to you, and actually a really hot welcome. We're sweltering away in the studio here, but um, thank you so much for joining us for what we hope is going to be a really fun evening of, uh, of going through some really cracking English wines. And some other wines. And some from other wines. Other from, places, from other places. From other places. So, no, lots of fun this time. Um, for those of you who know us from the very, very beginning, when we did our, our pre-launch party, we went to some vineyards. And since then, we have not gone to any vineyards until we got to go to the vineyards again uh, a couple yeah. of weeks back to, uh, to hang out with some winemakers. And, you know, we've, we've had a lot of fun with a lot of great winemakers, but there's nothing quite the same as getting into the vineyard and talking to the people and being there and cats ruining your, your shots and videos <laughs> yeah, and things like that. But that's a, a little bit uh, neither here nor there at the moment. So what we're going to do today is we're going to do three flights of wines, side by side by side. So we've got some rosés first, then a couple of whites, He's got no rosés. And this is why we have two glasses. Look at that. Two wines, <laughs> two glasses. Legend. This is, this is why I need him on these, on these tastings. Uh, it's, it's the intellectual you know, provenance that I bring to it all. <laughs> but I've always said, like, we, we yell and we shout about English wine. Oh, it's English wine, it's English wine, support English wine, it's got to be English wine. But I really feel that English wine needs to get rid of this little crux that it has. You know, everyone goes, mm. oh, this is pretty good for an English wine. This isn't too bad for an English wine, or I'm really surprised this is delicious because it's exactly, an English wine. Yeah. And we know that there are some big challenges that English wines face. One is that while we're, we, it's growing really fast, we still don't make very much of it. And if you've tried to buy a house in the part of England where it's good to make wine, you'll know that the land is quite expensive. So it's, an ex it's, a, it's a small volume, it's an expensive product. Um, <clears throat> so what we're going to try to find out, I've got to try to convince Mr. Oh, around the world wines are so much better. His sommelier here, Mr. World's well, educated. Not, 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 not so much better, not so much better. And I, you know, I've really got into my English wines recently. But what I thought was we'd put the wines up against some of what I thought was a fair competition yeah. counterpart from around the world. So for the rosés, we've got a, and let's get some in the glass. Let's get oh, wine yeah. number one Sounds and wine number two in the glass. So wine number one is going to be our Io Itico Rosé from, uh, from Greece. And for those of you who have been with us for a while, we, um, you know, at some point we did one of, uh, one of Gaia's wines. We did their uh, Santorini Assertico, which was lovely. Yeah. Um, so and nearly, nearly caused a family feud as well. Nearly caused a family feud. And then we've got um, the, the rosé from Balfour. Um, I actually went there last, what day did I go there? Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah, I think, think it was about Last Wednesday, Wednesday I, I popped, popped down there on my, my way down to Haitian. I got, got a couple of days out, went down to the seaside. Lovely. Um, <laughs> but what you'll see for each pairing, the world wine is always first and the English wine is always second. It's not that they should potentially be drank in that order, but it's just to kind of keep your glasses that you always know the first one is the world one and the second one is the English one. Um, the, the world ones we're gonna talk a little bit more about in the studio <clears throat> and the English ones, because we've been able to get out and about, we've got some video-y bits and pieces. So as we go through, we're gonna vote, which is your favorite? You know, do we like... Oh, well, no, I think we're saving that to the end, aren't we? We're going to pick yeah, what your favourites well, are. Pick remember what make your favourites are. Remember. But as always, we've got Poly V. So if you've, uh, if you've joined us for the first time, if you get to Poly V... Well, there's a, there's, a, there's a link just there's at the bottom link, of the screen. There's a link so, on the bottom of the screen. Um, it's, yeah. So do that. But, but before <clears> I talk about the rest of the world and what my feelings are, Mr. Taylor decided that we should have a proper intro to English wine. So uh, It'd be as rude always, not to, wouldn't it? let's talk about landscapes, mountains and... Um, whatever else he likes to talk about. Let's do a video. <laughs> England's green and pleasant land is a sweet spot for so many crops. It's not too hot, not too cold, not too wet, not too dry. 
We rarely get tornadoes, droughts, cyclones, hailstones the size of small cars, extreme temperatures, cataclysmic flooding, basically none of the extreme weather events that blight so many countries. However, the wine world looks at England in a very different light. You see, there are two bands that run around the world, one in the north and one in the south. And if you're in that band, you are seen as a wine place. And, well, we aren't. And traditionally, that is why the UK made beer and spirits. Until very recently, you would not have called us a wine country at all. The Romans, of course, did bring some grapes over and tried things out. They even planted as far north as Lincolnshire. But it was a real stop-start affair for the next few thousand years. Vikings destroyed the vineyards, the monks replanted, Normans brought their grapes over, Henry VIII got rid of the monks and their vineyards, but nothing really stuck. Yet still, the UK found itself at the heart of the global wine community. We were the biggest buyer of Bordeaux wines in the world, and we dominated the worlds of fortified wines like Port and Madeira. We certainly liked the stuff. And in the 17th century, we invented champagne. Well, kind of. Hear me out. In 1662, a chap called Christopher Merritt wrote down a scientific paper describing how fizzy wine was made. This was completely new to the world at the time. Now, it's hard to believe, but Dom Perignon, the monk known as the traditional inventor of champagne, didn't develop his technique until several years later. But Merritt only described it. The true inventors in this story were East End London publicans, who created sparkling wine entirely by mistake. What happened is that they would add sugar to barrels of wine to make them more palatable to local tastes. People would take the bottles home, and then the yeast tucked into the sugar and made the wine fizzy. But it was already well known that wine which continued to ferment in bottle would produce this gas, and that would pressurise the bottles because, well, the bottles would explode. However, an astonishingly strange coincidence occurred. You see, the French burnt wood to melt their glass and to make the bottles, while the English preferred to use their wood for making boats to fight the French, so instead made their glass by burning coal. That burns hotter and makes stronger glass, which didn't explode. Instead, you got delicious fizzy wine inside. Now that is all well and good, but our climate was still not even close to warm enough to make really good wine. The hotter you get, the more ripe and sweeter flavours grapes get. And England is not particularly hot. Enter global warming. This has had a dramatic effect on the English wine industry. Many of our summers now are as warm as Champagne, and even Burgundy used to be just a few decades ago, and they can make wine. We've also got serious about winemaking, setting up high-tech wineries, labs, and training a whole new generation of winemakers with formal degrees. The results have been astonishing. Our Champagne competitors, well, still a little pricey, are staggeringly good and regularly win the top prizes in the most prestigious international wine competitions. But tonight, we're hoping to show off some still wines, and those have taken a bit longer to come of age. For still wines, you need to rely on the sugars the grapes themselves develop. And in a country that's cold, that's a huge risk. Back in the 1950s, Germans were doing a lot of research into creating grapes that were optimised for ripening in cooler conditions and to resisting diseases like mildew that come along when things are a bit damp. So naturally, that was where the pioneers of the English modern vineyard scene started looking. Ray Brock was arguably the founding father of the modern English wine industry. He imported more than 600 different types of grapes and planted them in Oxted, close to the North Downs, just to see what worked. His advice led to a proliferation of grapes planted like Seval Blanc, Müller Thurgau, Reichensteiner and Uxelrieber. These made wine, but much of it was a bit of an acquired taste, especially compared to the delicious, cheap New World wines coming in. The next big breakthrough was a group of people who saw the similarities between southern England with its beautiful chalk downs and champagne, so they took a punt on planting Chardonnay, Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier, the three classic champagne grapes. Night Timber planted these grapes in 1988, and their winemaker Sherry Spriggs was recently the very first woman and the first person from outside Champagne to become International Sparkling Winemaker of the Year. Planting those grapes was a huge gamble. Conventional wisdom says they would not get ripe enough, but this was a gamble that paid off handsomely. Seeing the success on the international stage of brands like Night Timber, Ridgeview, Chapel Down and Hambleton, the industry has accelerated like crazy. And while still small, the area of vineyards has pretty much tripled since the year 2000. We now make Champagne Method wine, Prosecco Method wine, 
white, rosé, red, orange, fortified, natural, organic, biodynamic, dessert, and even ice wines. It's hard to think of something we don't make. And there are now nearly 900 vineyards in the UK, covering around 3,500 hectares. Most of these are in the southeast of the country, as you'd expect, with the real hotspots being Hampshire, Sussex, and Kent. But a huge number are now in East Anglia, with this region being seen as perhaps the most exciting area for making still wines. It can be a bit easy to get carried away by the success. It is still immensely expensive here and very marginal in many years. Last year we were hit by vicious late frosts, which meant we made far less wine. And this year it has been an incredibly cold start to the year. However, the new scientific approach to winemaking has meant we're able to ride these out and still make sensational wines even when it gets tough. This year alone, there are 130 award-winning wines from England at the International Wine Challenge, and for such a young industry that is literally battling against the elements, that is an incredible achievement. Uh, welcome back. I hope that gave you a bit of a background. As to, you know, it's, it's a short but also long history. It's, it's really weird that you can date it as far back as the Romans, and you know, some people are arguing that it was actually before the Romans that winemaking was taking place here, but... Um, it's really only in that sort of late 1990s period that we've had all this success that um, has been really, really amazing to see. And the growth has been absolutely incredible. 900 vineyards. They're, they're hiding out there. You probably have one near you and you don't even know necessarily about it. No, I, I remember when I, when I first started taking some wine exams, maybe what, 10, 12 years ago, and, you know, studying what English wine was, there was like, half a page like that in a textbook yeah. about English and Welsh wine. They make some, there are vineyards in Great Britain, England, Wales, yeah. and there's 412 vineyards, I think was what, what the facts were. And you just, and in 10 years, it's, it's, you just know, it's gone doubled, crazy. it's gone mental. Yeah. And, and three it, times the area as well, because there are some big boys planting. And one of the big things I didn't even mention is that there are champagne houses that are coming in. Domain Evermond is owned by uh, by one of the biggest champagne houses. I think it's Tassinger, isn't it? Tassinger. Oh, he's good at this. Um, he's good at this game. <clears throat> and so there are competitions, really, between billionaires of different types to try to plant out as much of the South Downs and the North Downs. And, and the, 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 with the one we mentioned... East Anglia is really interesting, and I, I, obviously we're going to come back to East Anglia because we're going there for for wine four. But we're, we're going to come back because we're going there because we're yeah. Come on, it's, it just just roll with it. Um, <laughs> Take but, the time. But um, yeah, the, uh, the 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 interesting thing is I pulled up a map from Wine Folly, which was probably dated about maybe five years ago, and it showed Norfolk and Kent, and. On that map that we had up in the video, you'll spot that this little bit in Essex, this valley, um, is absolutely plastered with vineyards now and probably plastered and, people and as well. And there's, there's, a, there's a lot of people in what are classed as the best yeah. wine growing regions are sourcing some of their fruit from Essex yeah. and taking yeah. it into their vineyards there's a, their there's blends. A, there's a, there's a, a Camel Valley vineyard, which is famously down in Cornwall. Absolutely beautiful spot, lovely tasting room overlooking their vineyards. Really cool place to go. And they do make a lot of their wine from grapes grown in the Camel Valley in, uh, in Cornwall. But they also buy in a lot of grapes from Essex. The, the, the winery Black Book in London also does that. And you know, it's do, a do, really you grow, cool do you grow a lot of your grapes when you make wine here? Uh, no, I haven't been to Essex yet, but actually I'm, I'm quite tempted. I think the only way, potentially. He was waiting for that, wasn't he? But anyway, um, let's talk Greece, because this, when we last went to Gaia's Wines, we were on the island of Santorini, and this is not. Absolutely, so they, they have two winery bases. So they've got Santorini, which is beautiful, fresh, yeah. sea air, salty, high acid. Mm -hmm. And this is on the mainland, so a little bit warmer, so you get this ripeness. Um, and this is made with a grape called Ioitico, which is a red grape that generally makes a kind of a relatively rich, spicy yeah. wine, almost, I don't know, Syrah-y in style, mm. a little bit light, a little bit more fruit, but that kind of thing. You've got, you've, got to, you've got to drink one to really get that feeling. But this is called four to six hours. And that's because, if it's called four to six minutes, that's how long it would take me to drink it. But it's called four <laughs> to six hours because that's how long the grapes stay on the skin. So when we're making a rosé, what you're doing is, if you, just, if you just press the grape very, very gently, the juice that comes out is white. And the colour in this grape comes from the skin contact. So the longer you leave it, the darker the wine gets. You know, it varies from grape to grape because if you've got a darker, thicker skinned grape, you get 
more color yeah. more quickly. So that's why if you have you know a Tempranillo rosé or a, you know a white Zinfandel because they're relatively dark grapes, you get this much richer color, much deeper color, much quicker. I just want to say the color of a rosé is not indicative of its style. It can give you a clue, but you can get you can get you can get some very very light rosés that are beautifully rich and flavorful. Yeah. Some very light ones that are wishy washy. Some really deep colorful ones that don't have a lot of flavor. Well, I think that's quite interesting because I don't know how it is for you guys, but I see these as pretty similar colors, pretty darn well, similar I, salmon pink colors. I think so. And you know, you look you look at the tasting notes here because we're yeah. we're on wine one tasting, and you know we've got those strawberries, we've got those Harry bows, we've got those kind of like those bright fresh flavors. Mm. And if we pop the Poly V onto acidity. wine number two, so you can start kind of popping your uh, your bits and pieces in there for the Balfour, yeah. we'll see where we are and what's different and what those, those colour, notes could be. Totally different styles of wine. Um, so we feel a bit guilty because we, we went down to Hashith and you went back there again and we spent an awful long time talking to their absolutely lovely winemaker, Ferg. Um, and he, it's a father-son team. He's the son. His father is still there on the scene, but he is now the head winemaker. And he's just a lovely, brilliant, intelligent guy. And we, uh, he's probably watching, so I'll stop sucking up to him too much. Um, but but I, I, we went back to try to revisit the interview, and we had spent about three hours talking to him. And so I thought, I, I, I can't really do this justice. So we'll, And also, we didn't taste the rosé at that time. And... So it didn't seem worth trying to do that. But if you want to get a feeling of place, two, two different things. So we go to Greece, this is single varietal. One, one wine, Iotico. This, as the Balfour, has six different grapes That's in there. Delicious. It's Pinot, Dornfelder, Regent, um, Bacchus and Chardonnay maybe. Yeah, it so it's got white and red grapes used to make this, make this wine, which is really kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, but for for those who uh, watch the I, watch the video, that I, I think I think that might be in the pre spot. Now this is this has got this has got the back of him. This has got a lot of as Monier is and has it. As you you thought I I knew this? I was reading the label. <laughs> it's got it actually. Yeah. Does? Yeah. Oh my god. Okay. Wow. So Dawn I, I was trying to be smart, mate. I was trying Very to look good. smart, Very and I was good. reading the label, and you, you you've ruined this for me now. Well, uh, happy times. It's okay. Uh, as but, long as we get the information. Right. But the, the little point. If you saw the video where me and Alex were stood on the balcony overlooking yeah. the vineyard, that vineyard right there is where this comes from. So you can sit outside on the terrace, and I did this last week, yeah. on the terrace, have a couple of glasses of wine. They do a fantastic cheese board, charcuterie, um, grilled baby gem lettuce with, uh, you know, oh, we should nice. do a bit of yeah. wine pairing okay, thing I again. That, that sounds good. Um, but really cool, lots of fun. But once again, we're looking at these notes coming out. Strawberry is yeah. the, the overlying the flavor thing, across the both. You know, we, we're going to vote for what our, our favorites are at the end. Um, but you know, if anyone's got any thoughts, any bits and pieces they want to pop in the chat, what they like, Please what they do. don't like, Go what they it. enjoy, what they don't enjoy. Um, so I think the other thing to say about this is Nanette. Um, Nanette is the owner's daughter. And uh, obviously they've named this after that. And the, it's uh, named by, uh, uh, they, the estate is owned by Richard Balfour Lynn and his wife. Um, they were responsible for, I think, Balfour Beatty, uh, the, uh, the massive rail construction yes. company. And that's why they own a massive, dirty, great, big, beautiful wine estate and good on them. Uh, it, but it's, it's a great place to go. We're actually going to try to arrange a little wine trip down there. Um, if, uh, if in July, can. if we're allowed, if, if we, we're allowed to, if yeah. we're allowed to, we're going to try and do our first little uh, trip, trip down. Away, so yeah. uh, anyone wants to come and hang out with us, come yeah, and hang out with us. Let us know. Um, but so, yeah. I, they're really different styles. I was not expecting. If you think how hot Greece is, that has incredibly high acidity. It it's really cuts through. It's zippy, and it's it's you know I mean, you'd expect that from an English one, but the English one is perhaps a little bit softer for me, and um, perhaps. A, tiny bit sweeter as well oh okay if you want something a tiny bit sweeter mate i'll save this for you ah the monsieur with this rosé you are really spoiling us yeah um do you want to say why this bottle of mateus is open so <laughs> this is a fun little story it's a fun little story and i'll do it very quickly and then we'll do the wine news and then we're going to start drinking three and four because yeah. otherwise everyone's going to be very very thirsty so this bottle, I kind of helped a, a local local restaurant clear out some of their stuff, and they had a few of these bottles left, so I kind of just took them on. And you know, it's there's a lot of wines out there that kind of get a bit of a not a bad rap, yeah. but some people get a bit snobby about wine, and they go, mm, "You drink That's Matthias, you drink barefoot, you yeah. drink what, what's the some some yellowtail, something? yellowtail kangaroo yeah. wine." Um, oh, 
every but, time. <laughs> but all these wines do a great job. They, they do, do a great job of what they're yeah. doing. And um, I blind tasted this on, on the guys at, at the winery yesterday and just poured it. And they're just, it's nice. It's fruity, it's nice. refreshing, it's refreshing. Spritz, yeah. delicious. So, and I think sometimes these wines get overlooked. Yeah. They Is do it a, complex? No. Are you going to write a million pages of tasting that? But rosé's not meant to be that no. a lot of the time. But, but if I, I'd, I'd be fascinated to go side by side against these two with that, and I, I might get another glass and try that. But uh, no, because you I'm can really do, you can, about the wines. You can do that another. I'll day. I'll do that another day. Um, but yeah, it, look, it. I, I think we should try not to be too snobby about wines like this because, uh, like you say, they are they're bright, they're they fresh, they're easy drinking. Do. It's sunshiny. It's happy days. Uh, especially if you're they, in Portugal. They are both. Fantastic wines. Yeah, these are. Uh, you know, the Balfour's a little bit lower in alcohol at 11.5, but it's negligible against 12.5 in there. And for me, there's not a lot to pick between them. Yeah. I think if I was sat outside just drinking it, I would probably drink that. Really? And if I was going to be sitting and kind of doing a cheese board, something, you know, a little bit of food, I'd maybe go that way. But it well, would, do, I, it would, I would depend the on the opposite, day of the week. But since I lost the food and wine pairing, well, I'd probably go with his recommendations. But hey, recommendations are only recommendations. Drink what you like, drink what you love. Um, we should, should we, talk about the wine news because yeah, let's should, get on well, through it. Let's get, let's get three and four in the glass <laughs> while okay. we talk about yeah, the wine news because good. otherwise it'll be very sad. I tell you what, it's definitely a rosé night though, isn't it? With this heat and the humidity, that is very refreshing. It is. Can we have a studio without like these lights? It'd be <laughs> lovely. It'd be lovely. Watching lights and studios do tend to go quite well together. Okay, so... So tell you us could, your thinking because I, I picked the Bacchus. You can talk about the wine news first and I'll pull these. All right, so let's see the wine news. So... Um, uh, we're going to start off, actually, uh, there is, um, this is nothing to do with England at all. I saw this on Twitter this morning. I thought it was brilliant. Um, there's a, an artist who's based in um, in Bordeaux. He's an American artist and he lives in Bordeaux. And he has come up with a new concept for exactly how the trams that go all around Bordeaux, very convenient, how they should look and operate. And I have to say, I would jump on this wine train in a second. I think it is brilliant. So, oh yeah, there we go. Isn't that clever? It's fake, totally fake, but somehow looks so realistic and tempting. So yeah, if you want to go on the wine train, um, well, there are lots of little pretty trams that go around French wine villages and things, but that is that would be a cool one. That to is the way forward. That is the way forward. So my little thing, just to mention, because uh -huh. I love lots of people, love lots of things. Um, and for those who know of me, I have a massive, massive hospitality background. So Alex is going to talk about the climate in a minute. Um, <laughs> but I'm just putting it out there because Restaurants are opening back up again, and there seems to be a lot of things running around, you know, and some of our restaurant groups and stuff like that that we see, that people are giving people a bit of a tough time. There's a lot of new staff out there. There's a lot of people who have found other jobs on furlough. There's a lot of people who aren't going back to work, okay? If you're going out, go out, support your local restaurants. Yeah. They're all new. It's all tough. They're short-staffed. There's lots of wonderful, wonderful people. So... Get out, support those. Yeah. And, and be understand because, it, you know, with reduced numbers in the restaurant, fair enough, they can't afford as many staff to pay. So it <clears throat> does mean service might be a little bit slow. But anyway... Order, um, order a whole bottle of wine instead of a glass, yeah. and then you have plenty more time before you to need to order something it. else. Exactly. Top tip. Top tip there. Anyway, so um, back to your real wine news. So that we're, was, we're that coming hospitality back to, rant. We're coming back to England. And I don't know if you have noticed, <clears throat> but it has been a bit cold recently this year. and um, Until today. We, in fact, uh, we now have a graph showing, um, and there's a few interesting things. I, I don't like to go into graphs and geeky stuff on the discoverers level. Yes, but basically, this is a graph showing how much heat the plants are getting. And if you look around, you'll see a lot of trees that are still looking really bare. The leaves haven't come out. And the vines are massively feeling the same. So the best year that we had in English wine was generally seen as 2018. And that got all of that, lots and lots of heat, beautiful, hot summer. 2020 almost as good except for one big thing and that was that the vines got hammered by frosts back in sort of about may april last year and that meant <clears throat> while the great the wines that are coming out this year are superb absolutely brilliant and that is proper right on where burgundy was a few years ago um <clears throat> but this year we are a long long way behind and on that 2020 they did not make as much they probably I, i'm hearing estimates from different producers of between a third as much wine a half as much wine if they were lucky yeah most people are 50 yeah. to 60 percent down 60 percent down it's not good so this year 
We dodged the frosts, which was good. That smashed up France, Spain, Italy, really crazy. Um, we dodged that because the vines were still in their protective mm. winter state. But there's also the balance <clears throat> that a lot of people, because they didn't know what happened, people who source grapes from other places didn't source them and therefore yeah, there still might wine. be not loads <laughs> no, of wine. There wasn't, there wasn't but, anything to source. But so. you, you take, for example, yeah. um, you know, the, the, the backers that we're going to taste today, if you love it, buy it quickly from us because yeah. we've got 20 bottles left. Yeah, that's, that's it. That was that's all we were all we could buy. get. Buy it and then go and buy it from the winery because they've got some at the winery. They're great people and go from there. But let's talk a little bit about wine number three first. Okay. Um, so we'll talk about oh. the Grunewald. Oh, are we, are we oh. going to do your question? Oh, my question. <coughs> we'll talk about wine number three. Okay, that's Then I'll do the question, yeah. and then we'll go Runa from there. Veltliner. I, I should read. I should. Veltliner. I should read the uh, the running order, really, shouldn't I? And then I'd know what I was meant to be that. talking about. I just get excited. Ooh, that's good. <coughs> yeah. Good, like a. I haven't so, tried this one before. Okay. So anyway, so this this is by, this is by Rabel, and we're in Camptau in in Austria. So the reason between these two wines going together is. You know, England makes a lot of Chardonnay, and I think that's the still, still the grape popular, that everybody grape, goes. Yeah. But I think Bacchus mm -hmm. is the grape that we can take as our own and hang our hat on. There's not really yeah. very many other places in the world making Bacchus. <clears throat> so no, ironically, it was de it was developed in Germany, but it's actually now too hot in Germany to grow it properly. So, so I thought, I thought, well, if we're going to have a, a Bacchus, let's try and find another place in the world that has a similar-ish style, but has a grape that's very much their own. And once again, Grunewald Liner, yes, we see some in California, yes, we see some in Australia, in Australia. but when you say Grunewald Liner, there's really one country that you talk about, and that's Austria. So we thought we'd take two places that are relatively cool, have this savoury yeah. note about them, and just see who could beat the other one. Best, best, of, the, uh, best of your own backyard kind of tasting. This, this is a, <clears throat> a massively unfair fight in many ways, because Rubble have been around for quite a while, and Austrian winemaking has been around for quite a while. So this is a tough, tough challenge. And, and Rabble may or may not have, respect. Rabble may or may not have won the International Wine and Spirits Challenge White Wine Maker of the Year 2019. So there's yeah. a lot of white wines out there. And what year and is this? 2019. Mm. So. Okay, so a tough, tough battle. However, on in the other corner we have Ben, who is an absolute legend. He gave up a career in IT just a few years back, went off um, and started studying at Plumpton College, which is the place with the wavy roof that you saw in um, in the video, the intro video. That's where also I learnt to to study wine as well. And um, and he did the research. We've been Bacchus has been around for a long time, but people didn't know what to do with it, really. They just didn't yeah. care. Well, while we're tasting that, should we pop the Poly V up for uh Yeah. Or, or do we need, or does it go to my question first? <clears throat> are we out of order? No, uh, let, let me see. Oh, yeah. It's Jamie's oh. question. Oh. It's Jamie's question. Okay, so we'll do my question very quickly. You can get answering that, and then you can start getting your tasting notes in for the Gruner. So, we have got to some vineyards, finally. So we've driven around, we've been to Kent and back. We've been up to uh, Norfolk and back. We're heading to Sussex. Sussex to Pretty, tomorrow. Right down the coast. Tomorrow. <laughs> so we're we're heading out tomorrow. So what we would while we're not able to travel, but we can travel a little, little, little bit now. For all these things that we've travelled, how many wine bottles of petrol do you think we've used? In our travels. That is actually how we might fill the car. That's how we, yeah, we, if we need a bit of spare, who knows. <clears throat> so how many wine bottles of petrol did we use in our travels? So um, chuck your answers in there and go from there. Um, we'll get that in and go, and then we'll move on to our, uh, our Poly V tasting notes for we that. We will, we will Absolutely. indeed. Let's know if it's not working because this is a bit the first time we've tried to use this particular one. So... Um, <clears throat> You can't, he's going in to put his answers in, he's cheating. <laughs> I'm going to have a look, see what it is. But, yeah, I think that's an absolutely delicious wine. We'll get on to the tasting notes. But uh, Grunewaldliner, am I right? Is that the one where we should be f tasting and all notes like this are subjective? Are we supposed to be... Oh, yeah, we've got 11 results. Fantastic. Are we supposed to be detecting white pepper, or is that the other one that I always get confused? So Grunewald, Grunewaldliner is... <clears throat> A great white wine for having that slight savoury note. So Grunewaldliner, yeah. there's two things that can help you detect you've got a Grunewaldliner in the glass. Well, three things. Three. Number one is you've got a bottle that's got Grunewaldliner on it, so yeah, that makes true. it very easy to know. Yep. But if for some reason you don't have that and you're playing blind tasting games and the likes of that, you'll get almost this waxy 
mouthfeel. It's got this yeah. richness mouthfeel. Without it being oaky, without it being lazy, none of those kind of things. So it's not that vanilla -y thing. It's just got this kind of like coating feel about it, like wax beans. Um, I get and, that. I do get that. And then <clears throat> on the very back end, you have this very slight white pepper, this almost like savoury thing. And this is why Gruner Veltliner mm. is a really good pairing thing for greens, uh, asparagus, salads, yeah. which are notoriously hard things to bear. You can almost do this with a salad mm -hmm. with a bit of a vinaigrette because it's got this waxiness about it and it's got this little spice. And vinegar usually kills most wines. If you try and pair a wine yeah. with anything with vinegar and you've got big problems. So, yeah. If you get vinegar in a wine, it's pretty horrific, basically, because it's a fault. You know, because it's what, then it becomes what happens to the alcohol. Vinegar. It, <clears throat> exactly. Um, but you mentioned asparagus, and asparagus, uh, obviously... There are different kinds of asparagus, the, the, the white asparagus, which is so very popular across on the continent. And I'd say that pairs beautifully. But our green asparagus has got just a little bit more herbaceous. And for me, Bacchus goes better with that. Oh, and sorry, I, did, I didn't realise this was a food and wine pairing competition. <laughs> and today's mystery ingredient was asparagus, pick your own colour. I'm about to produce it. and uh... um, But, yeah, um, <clears throat> perhaps we should go and listen to what the winemaker had to say rather than us whittering on about that um i don't know i don't know we didn't practice that bit we put, made sure the question came up but um, we'll find that out let's we'll find out Where's we'll, the, we'll come back to we'll it. get to it <laughs> so let's let's get let's get on to our tasting notes for the gruner so you can fill them in and we're here in. with ben who is the winemaker at flint vineyard and we're going to have a taste of some of his delicious wine today and the first one that we're going to try is his bacchus from 2019 um, ben, you you did a lot of the research into Bacchus when you were doing yeah. your Master of Science, and um, uh, can you tell us what, what, what does it take to really bring the best out of this grape? Well, I think Bacchus is an interesting grape variety, and uh, the research that we did um, enabled us to find out that it's more similar to Riesling that we previously thought. A lot of people who were making Bacchus uh, previously made, thought it was akin to Sauvignon Blanc. So we kind of thought, well, how can we make our Bacchus? You know, in that style, and uh, you can do things like with skin contact and, uh, and different yeast strains and fermentation temperatures and stuff just to try and bring out different characters. So it's kind of interesting. So, yeah, we do some of our Bacchus with a view to making it kind of more of that sort of aromatic Riesling sort of mm -hmm. thing, bring out some of that side of it, and some of it we do in a more reductive style to maybe bring out some of the grassier sides. Of some of that. And we end up normally with about seven or eight sort of component wines that we then blend. So, the idea is, is just to try and Get all the best bits in there. Yeah, and create lots of different styles and then give you some options of the blending table. That's right. And it's just, a, it's been a bit of a sort of a, yeah, a bit of a, a search, a bit of a quest um, to try and find uh, the, the recipe. What do you think? I think it's delicious. It, it's bright, it's fresh, and, and it's unique. It's its its own grape. And, uh, you know, I think Bacchus is, you know, when we talk about English vineyards and English growth. You know, Bacchus is the one thing that we truly have. There's a lot of people talk, oh, Chardonnay, Chardonnay, Chardonnay. Yeah. But I think that's because that's safe because people know that from everywhere else around the world. Bacchus is something that we do very, very well in this country. Lots of different styles. Obviously, I've been coming here uh, for a few years now, and um, uh, I, I think that 2019 is the best that you've done so far. Um, and everyone talks about 2018 being this like you know landmark year for, for English wine because it was so hot. But was that necessarily what Bacchus wanted? No, I think you're quite right. 2018, everyone was saying how great it was, maybe for Chardonnay, yeah. maybe for some of the Pinot varieties. But with Bacchus, um, there were not that many award-winning Bacchus in 2018. And for me, I think it was just got a bit too ripe. So yeah. when Bacchus gets ripe, it can get a little bit too many of those nice tropical things which then you can edge into slightly reductive sweaty sort of things and yeah. so we don't want that to happen and I think 2018 wasn't a great year for Bacchus Bacchus doesn't want to be sort of overripe you've got to have that you've got to have a bit of that underripe sort of pithy kind of character coming through as well fantastic so yeah 19 seemed to work really well I don't know the acidity balance was better in 19 I have no idea why, but we've, we found that the, the acidity is the pH. Sorry, that's my alarm. I've got to go and check some SO2. <laughs> that's that's wine um, maker life. Yeah. Wine maker life, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we just found that the acidity balance in 2019, for some reason, was better than 2018. I'll tell you why. Well, I'll, I'll let you go and do your sulfur test, and I will have a taste of it. Be back in a minute. That's so, fantastic. Uh, Thank you. It's, 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 it's the best of all worlds mm. wine. 
it's got like, well, you said reason, it's got that zippiness that you get from like, like a dry German reason. But it's got I forgot how good it was because I'd run out. But it's, but. Got, <laughs> it's, got, it's got this rawness, like it could be almost yay e. Yeah, it's, yeah. You know. It's the sushi if, if, one. If I hadn't drunk a bunch of English wine, that's not something I'd like in a blind tasting because it could no, be this or no, this or this or this. But it is inherently Bacchus. Have you got some? We've got, we, uh, um, uh, so we've just been having a little sip of this, but um, it yeah, it might be, <laughs> just always aware, I don't care, because I know whatever he's got, I've got, but, um, and, you know, okay, I'm sorry, done vaccinated I'll now, would you believe it? Double vaccinated. Yeah, I don't know quite how that's happened, but, um, yeah, yeah, I think that's what it comes down to. Just, um, um, we're here now, on the border between Norfolk and Suffolk, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's right. Um, and... You were obviously had the chance post your time in France working. Was it? It was in uh, um, Bruges, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, you, you had the chance to look around the country and go, where, where shall I base myself? Mm-hmm. And, and you picked here on the map. Um, yeah. Uh, well, we, I wanted to come to East Anglia. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was basically a, a rather large target to aim for, uh, because yeah, we uh, had things studied at Brompton, like yourself. Yeah. Um, did a lot of work on climate and managed to get all of some information from the Met's office that was only allowed available to students for free. So I had some free data, lots of it. And that was data going back to the 60s, you know, daily data for all of the different variables for the climate. I plotted that on a big map and you can identify that actually East Anglia is a very, very warm, mm. dry, sunny region. It's, even though we're a bit further north, we have very similar mean temperatures and actually warmer and certainly drier than those uh, down south and west. And so we wanted to come to East Anglia, and um, it was either South Norfolk, Suffolk, uh, or Essex, really. Mm-hmm. And we had some uh, Hammers family uh, live close by, and we got to know the farmer here through Hammers family. And uh, I'd also looked at some soil maps online as well. And I was looking for sort of lighter soils, sort of sandy, yeah. gravelly soils. And um, it just so happens that this is a real sort of area of gravel. We've got a gravel pit just over the road from the vineyard. So it was just a bit of luck, really, a bit of fortune. And, and okay. a bit of south-facing slope as well. So. Yeah, that's right. You don't get too many slopes in Norfolk, <laughs> but um, we, we've got one. And yeah, it's, 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 it's good. It's, hopefully it's a promising site. Yeah. Well, Ben, thank you so much for taking thank the time. Thank you much. Oh, sure. we, we've, we've really that's enjoyed it. Nice. They are great. Nice great. It's, it's nice to see people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, it seems like it's going really well, so congratulations. Yeah, things are going well, so yeah. thanks a lot. Okay. Pleasure. Yeah, and excited to get these uh, in, in the pouches and, and out to all the people yeah. to try it. So exciting. Yeah. Yeah. So. No, cheers. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thanks you guys, you went, you spent a bit of time out in France, out in Beaujolais doing yeah. that. That seemed a long time ago now. It does, yeah. I mean, the last six years since we set up here have been a big blur, to be honest. Yeah. Um, we've had two young kids along the way and um, done most of it ourselves. So, yeah, Beaujolais does seem a long time ago. But um, Ben's put a lot of the winemaking he learnt in Beaujolais, um, his practice here. And then before that, he'd been in the Napa Valley. So, yeah, those two elements, the real sort of science. Did you not? That's cool, OK. Yeah, only for a sort of three-month placement. Yeah when he was still at Plumpton. Okay. Um, but obviously that was real, you know, a lot of stainless steel, yeah. high tech. He was mainly lab based there, so doing yeah. all the analysis. And he is a proper wine geek, as you probably <laughs> see. He really enjoys that. And then Beaujolais was much more, um, yeah, traditional methods, less sort of, you know, textbook and more, mm. this is how this is how it's always been done. Um, and you've got this this Venn diagram as your logo, which I'm sure you can see on the yeah. thing. Is that, do you want to tell us a bit about the story behind that? Well, or? that is basically those two elements of Ben's winemaking coming together. So the real sciencey part and then the sort of traditional element and those two meeting. And that's sort of basically formed Ben's winemaking philosophy. Tourism is a big part of what, what, yeah. what people can do with And, you know, we're talking here for the first time with things that are right on your doorstep. So it is not too far to trek over to Norfolk. So people come over here when things are a little bit more back to normal. Yeah. Other than coming to taste these great wines, what, what can they do here? Uh, so we do tours twice a week um, on Wednesdays and Saturdays. And it was, we're getting really fully booked already just because I think wow. everyone's keen to get out and do stuff now. <laughs> We've all been up. locked up too long. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Ben and I usually do the tour between us and then uh, we obviously involve tasting of all the wines. 
and um, we're about to bottle the 2020 vintage that'd be really nice for everyone to be able to try those from sort of next month onwards um, and then we do a lunch as well so we do a 15 mile lunch which is just a, a sort of sharing platter of local cheeses and charcuterie and uh, all made within 50 miles of the vineyard local bread local butter it's, just, it's I mean it's really it's like a simple concept but the actual produce is so nice yeah you know we're not claiming any of the credit we literally just put it out <laughs> and give it to the customers and then they just get to choose a glass of wine to go with it well, they say what grows together goes together and you know yeah. here is that on a plate right there so yeah. so that's that that's fantastic and you also occasionally do these sort of fun nights at the at the winery don't you yeah we have done I mean obviously that hasn't happened not, for a long time long, now no. so we've got we started off um, in conjunction with Ampersand Brewery next door. It just seemed obvious. We've got wine, they've got beer, yeah. we've got outside space, we've got this lovely barn. So we started having these joint nights with them just one Friday a month. Uh, we'd have a live live band, some street food vans outside. It got slightly out of hand. <laughs> we ended up, because it was, wasn't ticketed, anyone could come, and we started getting up to 400 people. Oh, God. And it was, we, you know, we're not really big enough for that. So, uh, and then we had to stop anyway because of COVID. Yeah. So I think when we restart, or if we restart in ne- next year, we'll probably just have it a little bit, yeah, a bit smaller, <laughs> a bit more controlled. But it's just, all we did was sell our wine, their beer, food and music. It's the sort of thing that we used to go to in France and absolutely yeah. love. So that's, that was the idea. But obviously now we don't get to enjoy it. We just run around like headless chickens. <laughs> <laughs> well, Everyone gets to enjoy it. it up on the stage. Yeah, Ben gets to enjoy it with his band yeah. Hannah, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you and uh, we really appreciate you showing us around and uh, yeah a great place come down to Flint Vineyard thank you well hello again welcome back um, so yeah um, I think two absolutely fantastic wines very um, different wines very for different all of the commonalities but, but yeah it's you know it's the line that they, they sit in that same kind of yeah. style slightly aromatic bright yep. acidity yep. great freshness um, but we had some really good tasting notes and, and really about the some really, about the differences yeah, as well. Really good tasting notes. Um, you know, I think definitely more savoury on the Gruner, mm. definitely more tropical on the Bacchus. Um, yeah, with that sort of, on, like, what's I think what's quite interesting. We should say this, which is that when we tasted this on its own, it, and by this things, is the, the, Bacchus. the Bacchus. We went in Austria. <clears throat> I'll be there. So soon. many completely different things came across. Uh, uh, but now after tasting the Gruner, you get a very different impression. And that's how fragile our taste buds are and it's part of the reason why you get all these professional tasters spit out and try to get as little in their mouth as possible because it absolutely changes the perception of the next wine that comes absolutely you know i, I pick my favorite wines as to who gives me a hat though <laughs> branding genius it's a good happy hat. days it's a good it hat. is a good hat yeah. it's a very they're good lovely hat. people who and doesn't it's, it's a really nice who doesn't place. love a good hat go and visit them go and get a good hat and then bring me some wine yeah um so there was a couple of questions in the chat. One about um, the Gruner and did it have any oak in it? So absolutely no oak in here. It's mm. all stainless steel. It's temperature controlled. But where you get that richness is from the grape. It has that little bit of waxy. It has that texture and it has that little savouriness. So it has that richness on the palate that you generally don't expect from a grape yeah. that hasn't gone through some level of winemaker intervention, yeah, yeah. if that makes sense. Um, but absolutely no oak in there um, but it's, it's amazing that it has this richness about it without having any oak um, yeah oak you, get, on you it. get that from some other wines around the world don't you that sort of that that fuller body that you'd normally get a little bit of that that's coming from the oak barrel that it sits in um and it's just you know part of it's from the contact time with the skin um and part of it is you know you get these little weird ones like semion in hunter valley and hunter valley that ages and when it's five ten years old it tastes like it's yeah. been left left in an oak tree it's crazy absolutely crazy there's no oak at all anywhere near it so there's some weird chemistry that can go on behind that yeah. but um yeah so the other question we had was in uh, Mr. Taylor's video, he said, we make amphora wines, we make red wines, white wine, fortified wine, these wines, these wines, these wines, and we make ice wine. But if I go to Germany, uh-huh. it's got to be minus 10 degrees and I've got it to pick does. it by hand. And Germany, I think, was it last year, didn't make any ice wine at all because yeah, it didn't tough. get cold enough. And you're saying we're warm now. So how are we making ice wine in the well, UK? The, the, the extremities of temperature are obviously a lot wider in Germany, aren't they? Um, the, the summers are... Uh, you know, shockingly hot when you've spent a summer in Germany. It, 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 to to someone who has, you know, a, a, you know, who hasn't been there, you might be really surprised at how everyone's flocks to the lakes and tries to sort of, you know, get outside as much as they possibly can. Um, we are that more moderate country, so we don't get the extremities of temperature. However, there is ice vine, spelled E I S W E I N, 
And that is it's the German. protected term. That is German for ice wine. However, what is not protected is the generic term ice wine. So what goes on when you make a wine that is an ice wine? You are basically trying to freeze the grapes so much that none of the water comes out of it. All that comes out is this sickly sweet syrup with the flavours in it. And that means that each grape gives you ooh, about a milliliter of liquid. You need huge amounts of grapes. It is hideously, hideously expensive because you need so many grapes. They've got to be hand harvested in the middle of the night, minus 10 degrees, and it can't be done every year. However, ice wine, spelt I-C-E space wine. Oh, like a wine of ice. <clears throat> you can use a freezer. Now, is that... Does that have the purity of concepts? No, no it doesn't. But actually it can do something quite cool. But does so, it freeze <clears> the grapes <throat> to at least minus 10 degrees? It does. It freezes the grapes to minus 10 degrees and then they go in the press. And so, you don't have to do it in the middle of the night? No, you need a big freezer. But, um, well, it depends how much ice wine you want to make. There's a winemaker called uh, Zoe, uh, Zoe, uh, Zoe Driver? Oh, I've gone completely mad. But Zoe, anyway, You're she, the winemaker. Um, she was... Uh, a couple of years before me on the Masters programme at Plumpton and she did this at Hattingley Valley and we'll be tasting that wine on the Adventurous series and seeing if a freezer can do as good a job as a German winter. And, you know, who knows? I, I, I think it's a cool wine and it's great that we can make an ice wine, if not an ice wine. So. Oh, <laughs> as long as you do that, you can call it ice. It's like being in America. We're making a Rome yeah, yeah. style yeah. wine. Champagne style. grandfathered in terms. And, yeah. Exactly. Um, um, yeah. But yeah, I think when we, we looked at the tasting notes that came up, you know, we definitely saw those more mineral driven tasting notes um, with, um, have a bit more of that. with wine number three. Sorry, do you want some? No, I've, I've got to, we've, we've got Red City next. <laughs> that's fine, that's he, fine. He gets, he gets excited, doesn't he? He gets excited. Caroline, got Caroline's got questions. Excellent. Chats, there's a Yorkshire vineyard somewhere, isn't there? There is. Cheryl wants to know, because she lives up north. Up north. There's one in Rydale. There's the Rydale Vineyards. Um, I can't remember the guy's name. I met him on a course. Um, uh, and apparently Holmfirth Vineyard? Holmfirth, um... I've, I got as far as Flint. Well, that Carlton Towers, that, that, the, the, the one that was Towers in the previous thing, the, the, the posh, the posh uh, oh. Carlton Towers are just, just south of um, Selby. I oh, think. the guys um, who, with the mansion, yeah, that just put an, an, an acre out the back of yeah, their house. Uh, yeah, an acre and a bit, and, and that they, so there are vineyards in Yorkshire. Um, what I'd recommend is that if you look on your app store of choice, um, there is... Um, Sorry, app store of choice. Yeah, would you, We're not on the BBC, Googly mate. or whatever it is. Um, um, You'll find uh, an app called Wine Cellar Door. So Wine Cellar Door. Tap that in and it gives you a map. Every vineyard in the country gives you all the links, shows them all on the map. It's beautiful. It's a great, great little app. Um, so check that out. And uh, yeah, have a look. There are others in Yorkshire. Mm. So, some in Walled Gardens as well. Those are cool. And also, um, in the interest <coughs> of our four great nations, Yes. we have to acknowledge that it's also Welsh Wine Week. It is Welsh Wine, Wine Week. Now, I snuck in a secret little reference to that because I actually don't know of any fortified wines being made in England, so that was a bit naughtier for me. But the 1581, which is a port-style wine, um, again, I think it's made from Rondo, Dornfelder, those kind of style of grapes, but fortified with brandy, great brandy, mm. That's made in Wales, and there are some fantastic Montgomery vineyards in Wales. No, absolutely. Really good. Was it not? I've got to. I've got to work. I, I say last summer. No one did anything last summer. So the summer before, yeah, I, summer, I, I, yeah. I, I went around did a little, uh, little Welsh Welsh vineyard tour. Welsh vineyard tour, and uh, went to Tintern Abbey. They've got a they've got they a do. vineyard there, yeah. which is really quite nice. Um, and then Lanark is really well put together. So yeah. so delicious wines, you know. They're kind of you there's things there, that they're better at, and things yeah, they're not you, so good. You go there and you drink them. And it's lovely to go and drink them, yeah. but they're still a little bit expensive. Yeah. Great, great to sit in the vineyard and drink or whatever. Would it become my new house wine at 22 quid a bottle? No. Probably not. But absolutely fantastic. And I, I think, you know, Welsh wine, they're making some really, really cool stuff. But, you know, if you, if you take it as a separate nation, it's so much smaller than even what English yeah. wine is. So the economy <laughs> yeah. of scale is tiny. So it's going to be very, very tough for them to be in what we class as a very competitive price point. Yeah. They're just not. It's going to be... But it's Welsh Wine Week. Go out, like we said. Go out. Check it out. Try Try, it. try your... Um, I'd say if you wanted to pick two to go and try Montgomery Vineyards, they do a great Solaris. 
Um, and there's White Castle Vineyards, which do uh, this 1581, the fortified wine, a really cool wine. You, know, you don't, like, you think port, really hot, right down in the south, sorry, right down in southern Europe. It's, it's a hot place. And you wouldn't expect that to come from Wales. And it's not the same, but it's still a cool wine. And so it's really, really fun. No, and I think that's the same with anything. We, we can make these blanket statements and we can make these very kind of like quick judgments about, you know, if we go, oh, here's some, you know, Welsh wine or Scottish yeah. wine or Estonian wine or whatever it is. And open it up, drink it, try it. If you love it, it's great. If you don't, get another bottle. I think that's, and you've just brought on to it, so it's a Scottish wine. And we had, um, we had someone on who was from Scotland a, a few weeks ago. And there is actually um, a vineyard um, on, and I, I forget which one of the islands it is, but it's one of the northernmost islands of the UK. And it's in polytunnels. So they just use that little bit of like a greenhouse effect to, to try to make sure that they can make some wine. So, yeah, it's, there's stuff happening all over the place. And we're, we're a very creative and... Um, we, we like to do something with the limited resources we have, and and and, and, that, and that's a great attitude to have. Yeah. Try to try do stuff. If it's cool, send us an email and say we should do more Welsh wines. We should do this. Yeah. Because we, we're lucky. We get to taste a lot of wines, but we don't get to taste all the wines. No. So if you're, if no. you're somewhere and you've got a local vineyard, taste it, try it. And if you think it's great and everybody on this club must have it, put them in touch with us. It'd be fun to do that. Maybe we should do the equivalent of a, like a reader's choice tasting. Yeah. Like well, that'd be, that'd be cool. I like that. I like that. So, the nose of the Gruner, going back to that, I, I get a massively honeyed, honeyed taste. Uh, sorry, sense of that. And it's a, it's a really, and a, it, it, I think it goes into that waxiness again. That's that same group of chemicals. But this, it is elderflower, and someone, I think someone picked out that elderflower. But it's almost tasting it now next to that Gruner. It's almost as strong as elderflower. Way, anyone, anyone who can't see. Alex, well, everyone, only me and Alex can see. Um, actually, so someone picked out the end of that, and Caroline behind the screen's like, I did. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I did. I got held a flower. So Car oh, Car it was. Caroline for the win behind the scenes. Uh, she came out here and did a tasting notes next time. Well done, okay. Diploma. Cheers, cheers, Diploma. Cheers, Diploma. Cheers, okay. Diploma. Right. Let's move things on a bit. Um, but I, I, I'd love to know what you guys think. I, I wish I could see the chat. It's a little bit small for me right here. We're, 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 we're looking at a different platform which will let us pick comments and pop them up on the screen. But I can see Peach. Oh, that's interesting. So we get, we're definitely getting into that. There's, there's Lime there I can see. Gooseberry definitely, but lots of people. And the Elderflower. Um, and it's that Gooseberry character that made people think that Bacchus was like Sauvignon Blanc. Blanc. And Nettles. Nettles. I'm really getting nettles. John or the no. actual herby thing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah. But whatever it is, isn't that such an English flavour? I, I remember my grandfather used to make elderflower wine and um, I don't think he made nettle wine, but I think other people do make nettle wine. I make wine out of anything. Elderflowers, yeah. elderberries, nettles, whatever. So a great Polish lady who was making a beetroot wine and uh, had the perfect example of secondary fermentation in bottle because when she went to open it, it <laughs> exploded all over the ceiling of her kitchen, coated the entire kitchen in beetroot wine. And if you've ever put a beetroot near anything, you will know that that kitchen will probably have had to be demolished. Or just painted beetroot. Yeah, or painted beetroot, yeah. Just accept your fate, yeah. yeah done. That is your but yeah. Colour scheme. I can't wait to see what you guys think. Um, I found the more I drank of the Flint one, actually the better it got. And the more I, I it, it's a bit more subtle. <laughs> the more I drank, the better it no, got. No, no, okay. <laughs> there is a certain quality of drink that that, that saying yeah, will I go have, for. I, have, I will I give have, you that. I have the same with special brew, mate. Yeah, but, indeed. But fast tonic wine. But that waxiness that coated your tongue with that hid a few of the flavours and the flavours that hit us, um, passion fruit and things like that, which were really clear as crystal when you just tried it on your own. So um, fascinating wines, lovely people. Um, Rabble family, great, great as well. Austria, cool country for making wine. Um, I hope that was a quite an interesting little um, little demonstration well, for you. So. Should we yeah. do some reds? Let's yeah. do some reds. Oh. oh. Oh, yes, there it is. Okay. There we go. Thanks. That was the second glass of rabble, wasn't it? Oh. Awesome. So what are we doing next? Uh, I'm guessing one of them is going to be English. Indeed. So we're going back down to Kent. Um, 
This, uh, for those who weren't there on our very first tasting, Kent's where I grew up. I, I spent most of my years living in Seven Oaks, and um, that's just south of the North Downs. And the North Downs is this, this whole seam of chalk. Uh, you've got the North Downs, the South Downs, these seams of chalk that come through under the English Channel and link France and England together. And it's just an absolutely beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place. Um, and they call it the Garden of England. Um, for a good reason is that many place, things grow incredibly well there and hops grow well there. And what we've heard from some winemakers in New Zealand was that where hops grow, grapes grow. And so it's a, it's a really, really fun thing. But we are giving this wine a bit of a tough go as well. We're putting up against Chile and we did Chile uh, a few weeks ago um, with Lee uh, who brought out a guitar and um, that really really does Pinot Noir bloody well so I, I, I kind of apologize to the, the lovely people at Simpsons because this is going to be tough tough but not tough. but interesting I think the because line is... where does wine better than Burgundy in 2020 we had the same conditions as Burgundy oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I can't work out if Caroline's waving or trying to fan herself desperately <laughs> fair enough waving at us <laughs> no, she doesn't. No, she doesn't. So, so you're going to tell us a bit about literal. Is this literally the best wine? Uh, oh, come on. You knew it was coming, didn't that's you? That's even worse than your shirt. Yep, true. <laughs> and that's <laughs> saying something. But anyway, so I, th I think what we, what we need to discuss with these two wines very quickly before I tell a little bit more about the uh, Ventilera is it's not about one being better than the <clears> other. <throat> These are two distinct styles of Pinot Noir. And I think this shows you how cool Pinot Noir can be and how where it grows, it can be vastly, vastly different. And there's some people who are going to go, wine five is delicious and I don't like six. There's going to be six is just my style and wine five is not for me. Hopefully everyone goes, yeah. oh, they've both got their points and I like both of them. Great. Yeah. yeah. Um, but Chile really is about you know these big heavy red wines, Carmenere, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, those kind of things. Um, Caroline's going to play with the camera, like the cat. Um, Fantastic. We, we, we're suffering from the fact that now it gets light later in the evenings, the light levels change throughout our broadcast. So there we go, little little behind the scenes details that nobody needed to know, but that's fine. Um, right, back to me, yeah. You can see us again now. Excellent. Hopefully through. Well. <laughs> so. So oh, you Chile can see the shirt much brighter now. Fantastic. Wow, great, fantastic. Um, but yeah, so, so Chile makes a lot of these big, heavy styles. But there's this little pocket called the Leda Valley, which is in the north and uh, going over to the coast, where it's cool mm. enough to make Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir needs a certain set of things to grow well. It needs the length of growing season, but it needs to be cool because it gets it ripens very, very quickly. It's thin-skinned. It can burst. It ripens unevenly. You're so thin-skinned. <laughs> Wow. Sorry. <laughs> so can everyone just note in the chat that Taylor's not allowed a second glass of wine number three? Ever okay, again. fair enough. Yes, yes, <laughs> um, but <laughs> I'm lost now. Roll credits. Try, I, try, try wine, try wine so, six before try wine five. I'd say I, I'm going to do that. Um, if you if you have, don't worry. But I, I would always suggest you know have that one on the left and the right that's why we've done them in that order is so that you've got we know which one is which but i'd always try the lighter style first and so i'm going to go for the simpsons first and i'm not the color you're, you're, you're just being contrary um but the colors are so different the the, the literal is much more brown isn't it and tawny sort of colors whereas this is almost crimson i haven't seen an english pinot that color before and that's cool it is very cool it's very cool so, yeah, so little quality winemakers, quality wine, it's rich, it's drinkable. It reminds me a little bit of that California Santa Barbara Pinot-esque mm. kind of style. Yeah. Does it, I think, wine oh, number wow. six. And I hate to do comparisons of places from other regions. Go, oh, this reminds me of the yeah. like Burgundy because what we want to get with, with these English wines is they need to have their own sense of place and go, that reminds me of a wine from Sussex or from Kent or from wherever, not 
Well, it's kind of a bit low burgundy, oh. but that makes it a good yeah. selling. You're, you're getting into controversial people. grounds there. <laughs> there's, a, there's, um, controversial grounds. there are a, a set of winemakers who live in Sussex who have been trying to make sure that what becomes famous is Sussex wines. I mean, uh, and not English wines, Sussex wines, and. Most of these little boundaries and regions that we talk about in the world, if we talk about a Burgundy or a Cote d'Or or a Cote d'Henri, the, the, all of these different sort of little bits are defined by geography. And the geography that defines Sussex and Kent and Hampshire is the South Downs. That's, that's what defines it. So trying to claim it's got to be Sussex is a little bit naughty in my view. But anyway, you're right. That's what they've got I to do. Right. I but that's... I think it should be South Downs. There you go. It's not going to happen now. No. But there we are. Alex wants it to be south of the downs. Anyway, should we get some tasting notes in for wine? Yeah, let's see that. Uh, yep. So wine number five, a little bit richer in style. Wine number six, a little bit lighter, a little bit more elegant. So it's, I think we, we talk about these things that, if what <coughs> is the occasion that you would have these wines? You know, we go back that five, I think, is quaffable, drinkable, get it down here, happy days. Six, it's got that little bit of tannin, that little bit of grit, that little bit of earthiness that you go, yeah, I'd probably want a little bit more food with that kind yeah. of style. Um, so, yeah, this is drink it at an event with my mates, and this is have it over dinner in a restaurant. It's a beautiful bottle, though. I really like it. I think the labelling is, is top notch. Um, <clears throat> they said that, oh, do you know what? I'm going to let them describe what they said because there's a video coming there's up. There's a video. So, so. What, what we could say is before we go any further down the rabbit hole. Oh, Christ. Oh, let's have a video. Very good, very good. <laughs> Thanks for coming down to Simpsons Wine Estate. Um, so I'm just going to give you a bit of an introduction and a bit of a history. So um, Charles and Ruth Simpson, uh, have, uh, Charles used to be in pharmaceuticals, uh, Ruth used to be in um, humanitarian non-government organisations. And like a lot of us, they got the wine bug and decided they wanted to get involved in a wine project, make wine. And like a, a few, quite a few of us, they tried some uh, English sparkling wine, fine English sparkling wine, and enjoyed it and saw the potential there. Um, and it's so a pretty that... long term project, though, planting yes. and waiting. Yes. You know, wait three years for the vines to bear fruit of good yeah. enough quality, wait another yeah. few years for the wine to actually undergo all the maturation in bottle. Um, yeah. So, yeah, you've got to have a bit of confidence in your skills. Um, yeah, so and... they, they <laughs> built on their experience from uh, you know, the south of France. Um, and, but they realised very early on if they were going to do uh, a sparkling wine project here in the UK, you know, England, with its marginal climate that um, uh, the site selection was critical if you're going to plant a vineyard. So it's best, you know, you need to be in the right region to start with and then within that region to find the right site. So they, in about 2010-11, started searching, um, doing their research on where best, where best to plant. So their research led them to East Kent. They saw that it had um, higher levels of sunshine and warmth than other parts of the UK. Uh, plus, it also has some really good, um, a good, a goodly amount of um, chalk soils, um, and it's the same chalk scene that comes from Champagne and parts of Burgundy. There's, there is debate whether it starts here and ends up in Champagne or vice versa, but we won't go into that now. <laughs> Depends which side of the channel you start on. It's exactly so. right. <laughs> exactly right. Um, so they they really thought East Kent had uh, had, had the potential to provide um, some really significant uh, high quality sites. So having decided that, they uh, spent a year or so looking around and they found two sites here, in, uh, either side of the village of Barham. Uh, one that, which is now a Roman road vineyard, which we'll go and visit in a second, and the other one, our railway hill vineyard on the other side of the village. The whole project was supposed to be purely about uh, producing sparkling wine. So in their minds, they were just going, they weren't probably um, excited or as, as excited or enamored with the English still wines. They thought that there would be a, a, a tr struggle. But, uh, so though planting for sparkling wine, they stuck to the three classic varieties. Mm -hmm. They always wanted to plant Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Minier. And within that, they also decided to plant not only sparkling wine clones, suitable for sparkling wine, okay. but to add depth and complexity to the sparkling wines, they p uh, planted Burgundy clones of all three varieties, okay. a mixture of Burgundy clones. So there's a lot of thought went into uh, into the planting vineyard. Cool, sounds fantastic. Well, sounds thank good. you so much for the introduction. Yeah.
Making uh, red wine in England is difficult. Making good red wine in England is very difficult. Um, and so Charles and Ruth, uh, having said that, I'm going to concentrate on making sparkling wine and then uh, made some still white wines, um, uh, decided because of uh, the harvest of 2018 where there was an abundance of grapes, really good flavours and ripeness, um, so that encouraged them to make, firstly, the, a range of um, you know, rosé and still white wines. But a, a patch of our Railway Hill vineyard, first uh, crop, uh, as can happen with first crops sometimes with vines, they don't produce much, so there's a small crop, so they can get some intensity uh, in the fruit. And it was felt tasting there, there was an opportunity to make a, a red wine, a Pinot Noir dry red. Uh, so having decided that, uh, they thought about, right, well, normally with uh, a red, you do a whole bunch of uh, fermentation. Uh, they were concerned that the stalks might not be ripe enough, so you get that store green stalkiness character if you ferment with the, the, the stalks. So they needed a crusher to stem it, and the winery wasn't set up for making uh, red wine, so they decided to truck from uh, their estate, French estate, Domaine Saint Rose, the crusher de stemmer, a thousand miles up here to crush the stem, the Pinot Noir. And having done that and uh, happy with the, the way the wines turned out, they've kept the crusher de stemmer here and uh, the main St. Rose has got a new one. We think, again, varietal, you get that lovely strawberry and cherry fruit. Um, and as always with Pinot Noir, colour is not always the indicator of flavour. Um, unlike other red wines, as you know, Generally, the deeper the colour, the more uh, flavour and richness you get. Pinot Noir, you can have a light coloured one that has plenty of flavour and a dark coloured one that has no flavour whatsoever. So, Bright colour, not a deep colour, but it's a colour that you can see across the room. It really very bright and lovely. And then there's just this lovely strawberry and cherry fruit with a bit of spice. And a bit of oak and this, this got aged uh, for a while ago as well. Only about three or four months. You know, initial, when they first went to make the 18, the thought was about nine to 12 months, and they decided, no, the fruit is too delicate. Well, let's start. Preserve that fruit really nicely. Yeah, yeah, leave it at three or four months, and we'll see how we go in future years. There's a little bit of vanilla coming in there as well. Yeah, yeah just a touch. It's, it's light, it's fresh, it's elegant, but it's got that, it's got those, a few of those non-fruit flavours, it's got that little bit of almost like graphite to it, yeah. a little bit of yeah. spice to it. Yeah. So it's enough to know that it's there, mm. but not enough that it's overwhelming. It adds a complexity that's nice, but you've still mm. got a bright, fresh mm. Pinot Noir. And there's the fruit that can be quite sweet, but then there's a little bit of that tannin, but it's not aggressive tannin, and acidity that keeps it fresh. And it's really seamless. It just goes right through and lingers. Not a big wine, but you know, really, I think you've you know, got to work with the variety on the climate you have. If yeah, you try to make a big wine in England, you'll end up with well, and if you're wine, wishy washy you know, naff stuff. Yeah, I mean, I love Pinot Noir, you know. So, well, but, I mean, we're seeing that more and more that you know, and I saw it when I had my wine shop that people were going from that's okay for English to yeah. I, I actually want to choose it because I really yeah. enjoy the wines. Mm. You know, there's good enough wines there that will compare with anything from other parts of the world. So, and that's the, that's the thing. It's 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 great to drink local and be local and support local. But that's that much of the market. But local, but local's got to be good. Yeah, it's got to stack and, up. And if it's not good and it's not the right value for money, mm. why bother? I, I, um, but this I, is I lovely. Really like Bit of pigeon or duck, be lovely. Yeah. Full duck, yeah. yeah. Smoked duck salad. Smoked duck like with some pomegranates. Yeah. So it seems Alex might have been right after all. English still wines are lovely and no longer with the caveat of that's not bad for an English wine. Amazing wines that can be put against any of their counterparts worldwide. Hello, so we're we'll back. Mixed reactions to the different wines, but um, that's, that's the fun of this game. Yeah, so, you know, there, there was a lot of rich, fruity things in the, in the first wine yeah. and a lot of kind of like smoky, more earthy kind of things. But I don't know about the taste tonight. I do not get any eggplant in that in that <laughs> second wine. I don't know if anybody else got that. It's, but... it's a strange one, that isn't it? It seems to be very prominent. But um, uh, but I, I think what you're comparing here is, uh, and there's a lot of debate in the world 
Is England a new world or an old world country? If you look at its geography, it's right next to France. It's just above Spain and Portugal. It's definitely old world. And yet in techniques, it's more new world. And yet old world's learning new world techniques. The, 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 the Chileans and the Argentinians are learning from the, uh, from the French and, the, and vice versa. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. Does that mean it's but a bit, bit of a millennial, really? It's, then? It's certainly, it's a, it's, a, it's a truly global country to make wine. And I think what's really interesting is that, 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 so you heard the story now. You've heard that the Simpsons, they fell in love with wine and they bought this French wine estate and they moved down there and they're, they're living the dream. It's brilliant. They, you can find their wines in, in, in Naked and um, in, in Waitrose as well, some of their ones that they do, which are just for the supermarkets and just for the, the big chains. Um, and the wines that they do in, in southern France has obviously taught them that they're, they're Francophiles. They love things French. And what they've created is an English Burgundy style wine there. And to me, that is that earthiness that you get with a lot of Burgundy. Without a doubt. And I think there's, it comes down to yeah. what we're comparing wines against. Because mm. wine number five is so rich and so fruity and so jammy and so cherry and so bold. That the delicate fruit nuances in wine number six yeah. maybe get a little bit lost straight after. So if you've not drunk all of wine six and you're not going to bed anytime soon... Maybe leave a little bit on the side. Come back yeah, to it in back. half an hour when you've had a bit of a cleanse palate and try it again. See what you think. So the people, the people who were saying there was a little bit of smokiness or burnt nature to it, um, that's what you, you get a lot of people calling reductive. Now, it doesn't matter what that means. But basically, the Simpsons, what they're trying to do is preserve the most fragile flavours. And so what they do, just like Flint actually, they are the only two wineries in the country to have a press which presses the grapes under nitrogen. Now nitrogen is what we use to repack the wines because it stops the oxygen attacking and, and killing those subtle flavours. But it can lead, and I think Ben said this as well, it can lead to some slightly sort of sweatier flavours coming through for a while until delicious. the oxygen reacts with them. Yeah. And then the oxygen reacts with them and it blows off. Flavors. It blows off. It's just gone. And you're left with something that is still subtle and delicious. The, the, the Chilean one is really good. It's a lovely wine. And they're, they're, they are clearly in an in a absolute sort of microcosm of perfection for growing Pinot Noir there. Oh, absolutely. So, cool wine. Absolutely. Um, but it's I think not up to us. It's your, your it's tasting. It's up to you. So I think where we're at the now is... I'm going to give the answer for the quiz because oh, yes. that's gone through. So, how many wine bottles of petrol should we have used? And it's kind of not really. It, it, it comes down fair. to how many miles per gallon your car will do. Now, Caroline claims that her dirty, great, big BMW 4x4 will do 35 <laughs> miles a gallon. Oh, no, no, th no, 35 gallons to the mile. Oh, that's, that's, that's the one that's that way what around. She meant. I see, yeah. It's a hybrid. It's a, it, yeah, or or she, drinks th she drinks 35 gallons <laughs> each mile, and that's why she only lives a mile away. But we did cheat. Someone guessed it. Um, uh, well, no one, no one guessed it. No, no one guessed the actual answer, but no. someone did pop it in the chat. Yeah, said, we, oh, is it an electric car? It was an electric. Yeah. The answer was one, because I had to drive my car to Alex's house <laughs> to get a lift down. Um, so, uh, but if it had been a 35 miles a gallon car, it would have been 125 mm. bottles of petrol, wine bottles of petrol. And actually, that's, that is quite a thought of the day. And while we're on environmental topics, um, we have been doing some sums, because... Well, we like we've maths. got to be editing videos. We want to do anything else, frankly. And what we did was we worked out, because there's lots of people now doing these glass bottle things, and we've been using the industry standard figure of that, that pouches and things save 10 times the carbon dioxide output that you do if you're using glass bottles. But actually, it turns out that when you're using these small samples, and there are, there are other companies doing small glass bottle samples, and they're still really good, don't get me wrong. Lovely wines, lovely, lovely technique. Lovely wines, lovely technique, but... 14 times the carbon. 14 times carbon. And it's a vast amount of carbon dioxide that's that's just responsible, uh, you're responsible for just by buying one of these packs. So we're really pleased with that. And the other thing we're pleased with is we're making big progress on the recyclability of the pouches themselves. So that's exciting news. Absolutely. But enough geeky techy stuff. Yeah. Let's find out what you liked. Oh, yeah. Who won what? Who the winner is. So, why so, is it night? So, it's going to be your 
favourite rosé, your favourite white, your favourite red, and then your wine of we the night. We haven't done the wine of the night. Have we not done a wine of the well, night? Well, so pop your wine of the night in the chat. Sorry, pop I, your, I pop, didn't pop, do that. He didn't do that. So no wine of the night. No. Alex doesn't care what your wine of the night was because he wants it to be wine number six, and now he's disappointed. Actually, I... Caroline, I, what's your wine of the night while people are doing these things? Uh, number four. Number four, okay, so... That's so, my wine of the night as well. <laughs> it's my hat of the night. Yeah. Um, I'm torn. I'm yeah. very, very torn. I think... Uh, I don't want to be a sheep. I don't want to be a sheep. No. I don't want to be a sheep. But it is um, an wine. I think my wine of the night is probably wine number five. If there was something I was going to have a bottle of and oh, drink. Really? Okay. I love five as well. Five's good. It's but, an excellent wine. And, and, but, and, but the, and the, 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 the polls are coming through. People are getting their answers in. Yeah. Well, yep. can I just say the wines that I'm going to be buying after this tasting... A wine's number four and wine's number five. So four you said five. you're going to be buying after this tasting, I'm or I can see your tasting. screen that you actually bought it mid tasting during a video. <laughs> so, um, yeah. so, so, so just so you so know, there are it, only it, yeah, there are now now, six bottles fewer. Yeah, yeah. So, we, so we're down <laughs> to fourteen bottles of Bacchus because Caroline got a little bit excited. So, so uh, get in there, dive yeah. in. Um, but what we are going to do, we should probably put the prices up in a moment. Yeah, we'll wait for the we'll wait for the results. We'll wait for the results. That is we'll get the price up. But what we are going to do for everybody, and not Caroline, because she's yeah. already bought them, is um, because we've changed around, we've moved some pack yeah. sizes about a bit, and we've kind we're of still done some bits. We're not quite sure we've got it right. We're, we're we're trying to to get this right for you. But any wines that you liked either tonight or at any point that you've ever tasted with yep. us. There's a 10% discount code that you can use that runs through till the 20th. Um, should we talk about what's coming next while we wait for these polls to come Well, yeah, in? because we do have the other English tasting and uh, that's going to be great fun. So we are doing, so it's English Wine Week at the end of the month, starting on the 19th, yeah, 19th. And on the 19th, we are doing our Adventurous Series tasting, which is our English Wine Week tasting. All English wines. Yeah. Some of the same wineries, but none of the same wines. Um, we're my, myself and Alex. We're heading uh, down south tomorrow to go and see a couple of other people. I'm not going to tell you. three completely new wineries. I'm, we're featuring I'm, that we've I'm not going to tell you who we're going to go and see. Uh, but there's there's rosé, there's, there's cool red, stories. there's ice wine, there's all there's cool, organic wines, there's organic wines, and there's all cool stuff. Um, I would say it's what there's Hobbit houses. There's Hobbit houses. <laughs> And the line is, I would say, we could say it's what we feel is the best England has to offer, but that's really not it's fair. It's subjective. Because it's subjective. it's subjective and there are so many great people out there. So we have gone to wineries to try and build a cool tasting yeah. to give a range of styles, things that we do classically well, things that are a little bit different, things that are unique, things that are fun. And, and generally, where, we think that where we've got to meet cool people who are yeah. so uberly passionate about what they're doing because that's what it's truly all about. If the wine is great, that's really important, but yeah. we want to hang out with cool people. We don't want to drive two hours and be bored. We want to hang no. out with cool people and drink cool wine with them. So now, talking of cool people. Um, Hi. Uh, not you. Oh. Um, no, <laughs> Rude. We, we often like to feature a little musical segment at the end of this. And um, uh, No, 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 no nobody, nobody needs to know yet. No one needs to know that yet, but, but it's I, not me. I told Alex not to sing, <laughs> <laughs> and it was hard. It was hard. So how are we doing with the polls? Have we got... We... Good. Um, uh, I don't know. I, Just move it on to the next slide. Next slide. Uh, oh, no. That needs, means nothing to me. Oh, great. Um, okay. Go again. I will have a look. Yeah, I'm going to have a look on poll everywhere and see what happens. I wish we didn't have these little things. It would be lovely. Um, but it turns out that employing people who are experts in video content and online stuff is a little bit beyond our budget. So, so it ends up being the three of us who do... Everything. Everything, yeah, pretty much. And we've got obviously some wonderful team behind the scenes who do customer service and making things, packing, packing things. Which any, is, any final questions in the do chat? We, yeah, do we, we have final questions? Is there anywhere you'd like to know that you want to know where's the best English vineyard to go near me? So I think we had somebody who is in Oxted, I would say go to Squarries. Squarries is exquisite English sparkling wine, absolutely brilliant. If you're in Tring, come to Tring Winery, that's Tring. a great place. Marlow, uh, the Chilterns do great stuff. We talked a lot about Kent and Essex and Norfolk. The Chilterns, Harrow and Hope. Absolutely Harrow and Hope, Digby's brilliant. down that way. Digby's, really yeah. cool stuff. Loads of stuff happening around And Henry. if there's any winemakers oh, on uh, here that we've missed, we love you all dearly. There's just too oh, many yeah. to mention. We love you all. Okay, Deborah is saying uh -huh. Olney. 
Bolney. Bolney, a cool place to go. Really cool place. And lovely people. Sam and Lindner, one of the most supportive people of us from the beginning stages. And we love her. She's new. I think she's now the chairman of Wine GB as well. The, and yeah. So great family. Bol great Bolney makes some great stuff. And if you ever get down there, they've got a um, they've got a gin place on site called Foxhole where they take the skins from the Bolney grapes ah. and they use that and turn that into gin. So yeah, really good. cool. So that's there's a fox. So it's a great base gin. Um, so uh, okay, there's loads of questions. Coming okay, now. fantastic. Um, Deborah's also saying Bolney does a fab sparkling rosé. They yes, do. They do. they do. That's one of the best ones. Um, Mark is asking where near Hartford. Hartford. So there's an Albury vineyard. Um, I I have I don't know much about it. It's a little one, but I think it's quite a cool one. Um, I, I need to dig up the details of that. So I need to have any level I, of geography skill. I lived in the states for too long. I don't know where anything is. <laughs> I'm Chilton going to look winery, the Chilton great. Valley Winery and Brewery. They do beer as well. And we've got That's a cool place. And, you know, Chilton Valley's. We've obviously got Dawes Hill Dawes over Hill, at Radnidge. Yep. Make some phenomenal sparkling, yeah. and they 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 do for things that you could. They do a champagne style um, cider, which is really quite. Oh, cool. that's lovely. It's really so they do nice, some stuff. Yeah. Um, wineries that are doing other cool things, um, <gasps> and we're just picking up at the winery here. This is um, Hush Heath. They make cider. They make lager, they make IPA, so cool stuff. Wow. Have we got the results. We've got the results. Can I, can I see the, the results? results? Can I just say before you yeah. cheap lager, but anyone local to Tring. We've got it on tap. It's on tap. We've got it on tap. Yeah. So you can come and have. Wow, you've got to be quick because wines, Alex has it on tap as well. <laughs> so who would like to know? The, the rose winner by a tiny, tiny margin. 46 to 54. 46 to 54, that's Brexit level. That is Brexit. It was England. It's Hushy. Well done, Ferg. That's what, one nil to the England. Oh, that sounds like a like a Something Euro score. Now the favourite red, also actually closer than you might expect from the right. comments. Much closer than you'd expect from the comments. It is fifty-eight to forty-two for the Ventolera versus the Simpsons. Now, that's a solid showing. From, okay, from I have to put my hands gone. up. But before these polls came in, I did say the rosé would win and the. The rosé from England would win and the Chilean, and Chilean would win. Chilean and it did. would all come down to the whites. And I was very torn. So, dun, it's going dun, down to dun. penalties. That's the battle. You can't say that word in the month <laughs> of a European championship. It's Flint by a mile. 73 Yay. to 27%. Congratulations to them. And I, I, I really hope you had a fun night. In fact... 100% of people did. So, so brilliant. We, I have got the best question oh, from please. Magda to finish us off. Oh, Magda. Oh, she's uh, doing her WCT level yes. three, I think. So, so, so I'm a bit worried now. This is going to challenge you. Cool. Um, she says, Sotheby's Wine Encyclopedia says that English wine will always be a cottage industry. Harsh. Ooh, wow, that is Do harsh. you agree? How many vineyards do we need... The Sotheby's to change their mind. So I, th I think I think this, this is an interesting thing. We talked we talked about it on a on a previous tasting that if you look how many hobby vineyards we have, you know, seventy five is it seventy five percent? Something like that. Seventy five yeah. percent of the wineries in this country are hobby vineyards. Okay. Yeah. And that sounds like it's just people messing around making a bit of grapes. It's a very English but, tradition. We love allotments, if, don't we? You know. But if we then go to Burgundy, okay, it's yeah. broken down into such tiny little parcels. That they are all bloody hobby vineyards. They are by they the are. size of them. You get a couple what? of rows in this Grand Cru um, vineyard if you're lucky. And I, and I and I think yeah. what I think what the world world needs to come to as as this industry goes. I don't think it's about growth. I think we're making a decent amount of wine, especially in sparkling. We're making a lot more wine than we're actually consuming. Yeah. What we need to do is we need to find different levels of price points. That we need to find some really solid. Mm entry-level English wines that people can buy off the supermarket shelf for eight, ten quid. So the same thing that you go into your Tesco's or your Aldi or wherever you go, and this was twelve ninety nine. it's down to eight pounds, but it's English. I'll give it a go. But when everyone's getting, you know, their Riocas discounted and their Malbecs discounted and their Australian Shiraz is discounted, as much that as people want to go, it's yeah. about the quality of the wine. People are still very, very led by price. And until we have that entry level that we can go, how many people out there are going to say, I'm going to give English wine a go at 20 quid a bottle? Not too many. No. But if there's an option to give English wine a go at eight quid, and you go, oh, I kind of like that, and I'll step up to 12 and this, 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 this. That's what we need to do. We need to find a way to get some really 
good quality English words on the show. But I think that comes with government backing and subsidies and helping that happen. Yeah, There's so much tax and duty on wine in this country yeah. that is absolutely ridiculous. They're, they're talking about um, a subsidy for local vineyards that allow them to sell at the cellar door without paying £2.23 plus tax. On top, they, they tax you on top of the tax. That's a crazy thought. So, um, so that's one of the things that they have been talking about, and Wine GB are pushing that hard. But Magda, I'm going to come back to you because I I found a stat ages ago, and I can't remember the exact figures, and I don't want to give it to you, but it was about the amount of land in England that would be perfect for growing grapes on that was currently had grapes on it, and that is a minuscule fraction. So it's not. It's not so much about the number of vineyards, but it's about that area and the number of grapes that come in. But we have to grow sales at the same rate as we grow supply, or we'll end up doing what New Zealand did and having that crash of pricing. And suddenly mm. your English sparkling wine is going to be 10 quid a bottle, and, and it costs more than that. And I think it also sits that, you know, we're, we've always been a hub of the international wine yeah. trade in this country. We've got to export. You, 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 but, you get, but you go into a restaurant here, and we're very, very lucky going into a restaurant because we get to drink wine from all around the yeah. world, the best place in the world. If you go into a town in Spain or yeah, France or Italy, you know, you walk into a wine shop, it is 90%, if not more, of yeah. that country and even probably, outside that country, that local, region, yeah. that yeah. region. And then there's a little bit over in the corner that's wines of wherever yeah, it else. Used to be nothing. It's changing fast, but it is, it's still nothing, basically. Yeah. So. so it is. It's it's getting it in front of people, and I think what's exciting about being able to do a tasting yeah. like this is there might be wines in here that we go, oh, I didn't like that. I wouldn't have that. I wouldn't, you know, at that price, I wouldn't have bought it. And you know, maybe there's some wines you've had tonight that you go, still at that price, I wouldn't have bought it. But at least you've got a feeling of that's the quality that you can get from England for that price. And I think being able to do tastings and when we can get out and about, get out to vineyards, go and taste, you get to a tasting room, try the wines. If you love it support it if you don't love it drink something else yeah. um but we should probably put the prices up because i'm talking about we prices should. yeah so um <clears throat> it, the, uh, the prices are coming up now fantastic coming up now but there's a little code at the bottom so if you jump on the website so yeah, you can obviously get your 10 percent off on top of everything else and I hope um, you do because these support these guys have had a tough old year. They rely so much on that cellar door trade, uh, which they, is where they make their money. They have had a tough and, old year, but you know, also they've given us their time of day yeah. to come down and talk and walk around the vineyard. So we've been able to give you good content and a great show. So, you know, if you you know if you love it, get it from us. But hey, if you like the Simpson style or you like the Flint style or you like the Balfour style. Get onto their websites, have a look at what they're doing. And go and see them. And go and see them. So, so and the Simpson stuff, their don't, prime don't, don't stuff say, is, But is don't say you know us, they'll sparkling. double all the prices. Their prime stuff, their sparklings are absolutely classic. Champagne style, but with a twist, like that zing. Um, and they have a slide in the winery. You can go up to the tasting room and then come down in a tube slide into the winery. It's brilliant. Caroline. More questions. Boys, just... Just a little point as well, if people really liked a style tonight, yeah. if they email in and say, I really like this style, can yeah. you recommend more like it? We to, can do talk that, to right? Us. We're right yeah. here. Um, Give us a just, shout. We, we can influence. mix and match. We can source wines for you. Yeah. So if there's something that you've had previously Absolutely. or whatever, let us know what you like to drink. We can put mixed cases together for you with some tasting notes, chuck them out, whatever we'll, you we'll like to do. We'll tell you about our mate who's told us there's something coming in six months' time or two months' time or whatever it is. And, uh, yeah, we, yeah, we know people. So. Yeah. If you need someone to help you fill your wine cellar. Happy times. And then once we've filled it, if you need someone to help you empty your wine cellar again, we can do that as well. We're very helpful. So, well, I think looking at the figures, it was quite clear that the winning wine of the night probably was the Flint Bacchus. So what we did is we had a guess beforehand and we decided that whoever won tonight would sing us a song. Indeed. So <laughs> before we go there, next month, so we've got Premium England at the end yep. of the month. So Lovely. get in, there's still some options to do that. If you've got friends who you think would have loved tonight, we've got a few sets left, so if they want to dive in, they can oh, buy that and catch up. There's an email coming with all the links to do Ca all the Caroline's, Caroline's, Caroline's going to email you all, so you know what's going on. Um, if Cherry's not got in touch with you, read your subscription, because we're changing things around. Shout us it. We're trying to get that, but there's only three of us yeah. plus Cherry. We love you all dearly. Next month, we are doing Wines of Germany uh, for Discoverers, and it Wait, may or may not be... The 31 days of German Riesling. So the adventure is going to be all about Riesling. Um, 
I'm I'm in the middle of sorting out a promotion. Um, the 31 days of Riesling is my favourite time of year, and I it's am like working Christmas, out dude. 31 Rieslings to be happy. Oh, yes. On that note, on that have note. a wonderful Let's night. Have the song. Let's sing Thank a song. You. Good night. We'll see you next Thank time. You. Thank you so much.